Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to talk about fisheries. It's one of my favorite topics. We're going to look at what a fishery is and then we're going to look at all the different techniques that exist for catching fish and then lastly we're going to learn about some of the environmental effects of overfishing. So let's get started. Okay, well let's look at what a fishery is. So a fishery is a concentration of fish species that we collect or harvest. Now there's different places that we can collect these fish from. Um, most of our fish come from the ocean, and so it's ocean catch. Um, about 20% comes from aquaculture or mariculture, that is fish farming, and it's a relatively new technique. And then 10% comes from lakes and rivers. So this picture is an overview of all the different fishing techniques that exist. Um, it also includes things like satellite tracking and spotter airplanes. That's how fish are identified in the water. And then of course we have our drift nets, long lines, persanes. We're gonna talk about all of those and then finish it up with environmental impacts. And of course, we have to talk about aquaculture. Our first method for catching fish that we're gonna look at that is practiced by commercial fishermen is called persaining. And so in a persane, what the boat does is they find a school of fish and then they drop a net in the water. The top of the net, there's a buoy to keep it afloat. And at the bottom of the net, there's a weight. Okay, so they drop that line, the net, and then they circle around the school of fish. Well, once they've completely encircled the school of fish, they pull this line. And what it does to the net is it pretty much encloses the net into like a drawstring bag. And so when you pull that, it pretty much encloses all the fish and then you can pull it up on your boat. Now this is an indiscriminate method of fishing because it doesn't discriminate what is in the, what is in the school of fish. So for example, if you were fishing, I don't know, let's say tuna, and there were some dolphins and turtles in with this school of tuna, um, they would also be coming up in the bag. So it's rather unfortunate. All right, our second technique uh, for commercial fishing is called a drift net or a set gill net. They work similarly to a purse same. So what you do is again, you have your buoy on the top of the net and a weight at the bottom and you throw it into the water and you just kind of let it drift there. That's why it's called a drift net. Well, each fishery will have a specific net size depending upon what kind of fish they want. And so the idea is if the fish is swimming along, the fish will enter into the net and get stuck. Okay, and then once it gets stuck and caught, then you can reel it in on your boat. These can be up to a mile long and hang 50 feet down into the water. And again, they are indiscriminate as well because if there's a fish that comes along that you don't necessarily wanna catch but gets stuck in the net, it's coming up when you pull up the nets. So let's take a look at some of the pictures here. You can see here is a whale that is stuck in a set drift net. And of course it captures other wildlife as well. So again, it's an indiscriminate method. This brings us to our third technique, which is called trawling or a trawl bag. And in a trawl bag, what you do is you take a big bag and you drop it down to the bottom of the ocean. And then you simply just drag the bag along the bottom in the hopes that you're gonna capture whatever fish you're looking for. If you've seen the movie Finding Nemo, this is what they do at the end there. This is commonly used for bottom dwelling fish, so fish that like to hang out at the bottom of the ocean or the, the ground there. Um, so shrimp are a very good example of things that are caught in a trawl bag. I, one of the things though that trawling does, because it does drag a bag on the bottom of the ocean, is it really tears up the environment down there. So you have a lot of habitat loss. It really turns the area into a barren desert in that there, there are not a lot of places to hide or live because you've dragged this bag along the bottom and really just destroyed the habitat. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that trawl bags are also indiscriminate. So anything that's at the bottom of the ocean that you are scouring the bottom for will come up in that bag. So here's a great example. You can see this is a trawl bag for shrimp. And I don't know about you, but I see a couple shrimp in there, but I do see a lot of other what is called bycatch. 
organisms that come up in the bag that weren't intended for, but they got caught in the bag. So you can see there's a ray, there's a sea star, some different species of fish, and then of course you have some shrimp. Our last commercial technique that we're gonna talk about is long lining. And of all of them, this one's pretty simple. You take a long line, you bait it with hooks, so you drop some lines down from it and put bait on the hook, and then you just throw it out into the ocean. And so you, the hope is that something will come along and eat the bait and of course get stuck on the hook. This is commonly used to catch larger things. So things like shark, tuna. Um, oh, and this is also seen in the movie Perfect Storm, if you've ever seen that. It's, it's the same um, fundamental idea. So again, this is indiscriminate because as you can see from the picture here, anything swimming along that is hungry and bites into a baited hook could get stuck on the hook. So you can see that here with the turtle. Um, this also happens with albatross. So albatross, um, they are an ocean bird. And when they see something shiny in the water, they dive down and grab it. Well, if that shiny thing is a hook with bait on it, then they get stuck on the hook. And so here's another close-up picture of the albatross um, with the hook in its mouth. A technique that fishing businesses have used um, are called fish factory ships. And so what they do is instead of like catching the fish and bringing it back to shore, they will catch the fish out in the ocean and then deliver it to one of these ships. And on the ships, what they do is they process the fish and then put it on ice. So that way the fish can stay out at sea for longer periods of time. Thus, that means the fishermen can fish more and catch more and not worry about the fish actually rotting. And so on these fish factory ships, again, they process the fish, they can freeze it, they put it in nice little packs, and then they bring it ashore. What unfortunately that means to the consumer is that sometimes you think you're eating fresh fish, but it could have been out on this fish factory ship for up to six months. So here are some pictures of those fish factory ships. So you can see on the upper left, um, we have what looks like a fish processing conveyor belt. And so obviously the fish are loaded there and then processed. And then in the bottom right, you have a picture of how just gigantic some of these fish factory ships can get. So let's spend a little time talking about sport fishing. So the idea behind sport fishing is that you capture the fish, um, sometimes people do keep it and consume it. Other times they practice what's called catch and release. So they capture the fish, they take their picture, and they release it back into the water. And hopefully it's still alive. Um, in order to sport fish, you usually have to buy some sort of permit from your agency that controls fisheries. So here in California, it's the California Fish and Wildlife Service. If it's a federal area, it's usually the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But what's great about that is those permits require a fee. There's a cost to it. And so with that money, the government can then um, invest in making sure that the fishing and the fisheries are well populated, well stocked, and that people aren't violating the rules so that the fish actually survive. Okay, time for the problems. So these problems exist in all commercial fishing techniques that we've talked about. Number one, they're indiscriminate. That means they do not discriminate as to what fish come up in the bag. So if you're a fish species that aren't being harvested and you're in the area, you usually come up with the bag and unfortunately do not survive. There's another issue that we're gonna talk about, what are called ghost nets. Um, ghost nets are nets that keep killing. You can see them here in the pictures. A lot of times when fishermen, they find that their nets get stuck, they simply cut them. And then those nets just float around in the water and continue to cause problems. And then lastly, we have bycatch. Now again, bycatch has to do kind of with the indiscriminate stuff we were talking about. Bycatch are species that are not wanted that come up with the bag. So here's a picture of a ghost net. So again, a ghost net is a net that is drifting in the water and it was usually placed there by a fishing vessel who didn't want the net anymore. So either the net got stuck or it was it got a hole in it, it's no good. Um, it was just released into the water and is floating around. So here you can see this is a turtle that's caught up in a ghost net. So we also have another picture here of a marine mammal in a ghost net. Now something that our 
legislators required is um, on trawl bags for turtles, there must be what's called an exclusion device. So an exclusion device can usually be found in the net, usually towards the back of the net, and apparently it's supposed to be a hole that allows turtles to escape from. Now the research on exclusion devices isn't all that great. Sometimes the turtle can find the hole and get out. Sometimes it can't, but it is helping some of the turtles escape from trawl bags. And another problem is bycatch. So we've talked about bycatch. These are species that are not wanted by the fishermen, but they come up in the bag because they were in the same area of whatever they're fishing. Now, a lot of times the fishermen don't have room for these bycatch species on their boat. So what they'll do is they'll toss them over. And unfortunately, a lot of them, by the time they get up to the boat, because of the pressure differences, they're not alive. So um, I know a lot of times people are like, oh, why don't you just throw it overboard and it'll be fine. But unfortunately, the fish is usually dead by the time it comes up on the boat. Another environmental problem that happens with overfishing is the top predator removal. So for example, um, if you're fishing swordfish or tuna, right, or shark, those are your top predators in the aquatic ecosystems. So when you remove them, you allow the species underneath to overpopulate and pretty much get out of control because you've taken out the top predator. Also, um, when fishermen are hunting, they tend to want the biggest of the breed, right? The biggest of that species. And so when they sometimes target the bigger ones, they leave behind the smaller and maybe weaker ones. And so then what happens is they breed and they procreate and of course leave behind the traits of the smaller weaker ones. So what you see over generations of time is this, the shrinking or the smaller size of a species. And they actually have seen this in the bluefin tuna population. Our last environmental problem that's associated with overfishing is shark fishing. So in shark fishing, what fishermen do is they capture the shark and then they cut off the fins of the shark. Now you might be asking, well, why the fins? The fins are often used in a soup called shark fin soup. And so apparently it's supposed to taste really good and people really enjoy eating it. So there's a demand for the shark fins. It can also be used in med medicines, but unfortunately, a lot of the shark species now are becoming endangered because of this practice. Okay, well that leads us into our last topic, which is mariculture or aquaculture. And you might be asking yourself, well, what's the difference? Aquaculture tends to take place in freshwater environments where mariculture tends to take place in marine environments or ocean systems. Um, what's the basic idea behind this? You farm your fish. So instead of going out to the ocean and capturing the fish or going to the lakes and rivers and capturing them, you farm them in nearby controlled environments. This is sometimes referred to as the blue revolution, not the green revolution, because it involves farming fish. So what you're looking at here is a typical pen for a fish farm. And so what organisms are commonly farmed? Well, they have to be somewhat small, right? I, I can't imagine farming a tuna in a pen like that. Um, but things like catfish, abalone, shrimp, and salmon are commonly farmed in fish farms. So here's a picture of an abalone in case you've never seen one. Abalone are pretty much sea snails. They have this giant foot that people apparently love to eat. And I always get asked this question in my class, how can you tell the difference between, for example, farm salmon and wild caught salmon? Well, it should be on the label. So if you've ever just looked at the label of your fish, if you buy it at the store, for example, you should see how it was caught. Um, in a restaurant, if again, you're curious, you can always ask the waiter or waitress. They sometimes don't know the answer, but the chef behind the scenes should know the answer if it was farmed or wild caught. So here is a closer look at salmon farming, um, which is commonly done in aquaculture. 
So the salmon are usually kept in a pen for about four years until they're about four to 11 pounds in size. What are they feeding them? Well, they're fed fish meals. It's kind of weird um, to think that fish are fed fish, but that happens in the aquatic systems. And that fish meal is usually composed of anchovies. So they kind of grind it up and feed it to the salmon. There are many advantages to farming fish. So first off, um, the wild populations are able to increase. And that is simply because we're not there taking the fish. So they're allowed to reproduce and grow. Secondly, it does save human lives. If you've ever seen any of those Alaskan fish shows like Deadliest Catch, you'll know how dangerous it is to go out into the open ocean and capture fish. So if you're farming fish, you're really removing that element of human safety because you're not having to go out in storms and capture fish. Um, thirdly, there's no ghost nets, there's no bycatch. Pretty much what you're farming is what you're going to get. And then lastly, it does tend to be cheaper because you're not having a lot of this maintenance, transportation, and human issues that we just talked about. All right, so just like in AP Environmental, there are good things and there are bad things to every topic. So let's talk about some of the bad things that exist with farming fish. First off, when you're farming fish, you have a fish strain of that species. Sometimes that fish species can get out of the pen, maybe there's a hole in the pen, and it can go mate with the wild population. Once it does that, it has now decreased the genetic biodiversity of the wild population because you introduce this farm strain into the population. Another thing that's very common in farm fish is disease. When you pack in fish into a small pen, and remember you're trying to maximize profits because you want as much fish as possible, um, disease can spray it, spread pretty rapidly throughout the population. So what you do, what these fishermen do, is they add antibiotics into the water. So sometimes when you're eating farm fish, you are getting that dosage of antibiotics that was given to the fish. There's mass fecal pollution near the waterway where the pens are kept. I mean, just imagine all those fish in the pen and they are producing feces. That feces has to go somewhere. And then lastly, it does take an immense amount of fish meal to feed farmed fish. So some would argue, is that energy efficient if we're having to pretty much raise a lot of fish meal to feed the fish that eat it? All right, well, that concludes our discussion on fisheries, and I hope that was extremely helpful for you. Thank you so much.